thank you so much uh, for taking the time and uh, speaking and being the first guest of the Diplo Woman podcast. Uh, 131 years until you came along and smashed the glass ceiling and became the first female editor of the Financial Times. Tell us uh, how easy was your path? I think what has been happening in, in um, recent years um, and you know, probably over more than, than a decade is new, newsrooms have been changing and evolving um, and gender diversity uh, has become a far more uh, important uh, priority. Um, so, you know, if, if you look at our intake, the, the people that, you know, we've hired at the FT over, over recent years, there are more women than men. But of course, these are more um, and new entrants and so younger talent. And I think in a lot of newsroom, you see a difference between the composition of younger talent and the, comp and the composition of leadership. Um, so, and for me, um, a lot of my work is about building that pipeline. So not only bringing in um, younger talent, but also trying to promote and also attract uh, women at different levels of, um, of the organization. I, you know, I was one uh, of four or five ca candidates for, uh, for the editorship. Um, and I think I benefited from the fact that I was deputy editor. So quite often um, I was running um, the, you know, the, the news agenda and, um, and the F FT editorial. That gave me, I think, a lift in, in many ways. And I think I had a, um, an editor who was very supportive. Um, and uh, who, who was a very good mentor, um, and and that was that gave me an additional uh, boost. So yes, first woman, one hundred thirty uh, one years, but you will find that in um, in a lot of news organization and and indeed across the business uh, world, um, this is what's this is what's happening now, and maybe it's very late. Um, but the, the good news is that there are more and more women uh, editors of, of major organizations. In, in, in the UK, there are several uh, women who are now um, editors. I feel quite envious hearing you say that because in the world where I come from, in the political, diplomatic, international affairs world, uh, that isn't that obvious women have been struggling much more to uh, get to top high level decision um, making positions and uh, you know as we've discussed before uh, celebrating the 20th anniversary of the women peace and security agenda in 2020 we've come to realize that although 20 years have passed and you know we've achieved a lot still the numbers are low we don't see enough you know women in in peace processes and negotiations as heads of states um, and you know assuming these high level positions that somewhat are you know more uh, you know obvious in the business world let's say or in the in the news uh, world so I think here we have an opportunity to partner and see how the media can help push forward this women peace and security agenda I know you've been so vocal about women empowerment and peace you've spoken about this you know how we can give uh, you know you know, switch the equation, making uh, what seems to be vulnerable uh, populations such as women, you know, give them that uh, less victimized role and give them more voice and more power. Uh, I think the media has a huge role to play, a key role to play in the next 20 years to advance this agenda. Tell me a little bit what you think the media could do. I, I think what the media does is reflect on the world that we live in. Um, the media uh, also informs, and the media, I think, can, can have uh, an influence, uh, but it cannot drive an, ag an agenda such as this. Uh, it can, you know, it can help promote it in, in many ways. I mean, you, you, if you look um, at the FT, we have the Women of 2020 uh, magazine issue, and we do this every year. And, you, and you'll see in, um, in that publication that 
you know, we pick women of, from, from, from all around the world and women who have made a difference. And many of them are actually either activists or uh, politicians who've made a real difference. Um, I, for instance, wrote, uh, wrote up an interview with Ursula von der Leyen uh, for this for this magazine issue, um, so these are examples of what of what the media uh, can do to to promote the agenda uh, more. Uh, but but I do think that at the end of the day, you know, we reflect on uh, on the world that that we live in, um, and I think it's very interesting to look at at Europe when we when we talk about uh, breaking. Um, the glass ceiling. We have three women today who are in the leading positions in Europe. We've got Christine Lagarde at the ECB. We've got Ursula von der Leyen at um, uh, the president of the European Commission. And we have An uh, Angela Merkel, of course, who is still the driving force in Europe, uh, leading uh, Germany. And this trio of women, I think, are making a difference. And I think that all three of them are very vocal and very committed uh, to the advancement of women, particularly in the fields of politics, peace, and security. I'll say one other thing that in, in my in my experience, experience from, uh, from my own uh, reporting, there's no doubt that involving women more in peace and in negotiations um, is helpful to, to uh, achieve positive um, outcomes. Um, and and you, you see this in, um, in Syria, for example, where women activists have had a, you know, a very um, loud um, and impressive voice. Um, so I think that there is a, I think there's an evolution that still has to happen because we see women now much more involved in activism. Uh, in some areas, as I mentioned, in, in Europe, they are, in some cases, achieving positions of power. Uh, but that has to be the priority. I think women in, in peace and security, um, this is almost a, a, um, a natural flow from women achieving greater positions of political power. Absolutely. You've mentioned quite a few diplomen and uh, you know, women that you've met, you've interviewed, uh, and you've seen while you were on the ground covering the Middle East uh, when you were the Middle East editor of the, of the Financial Times. Um, can you think of a, a couple of stories or an anecdote that uh, it happened with you while you were on the ground covering the Middle East, uh, where you saw women playing an active role um, in building their communities and bringing, you know, uh, different points of views together, acting as mediators and, and so on? There are so many stories, uh, whether it is from, you know, my early reporting days in Algeria, where uh, the mothers of the disappeared, uh, for example, I think played a very important uh, political role and were at the forefront of opposition uh, to, to the regime. And I met so many uh, impressive women who never gave up the fight. They were fighting for years and years and years, and they are the ones who are the least afraid. Uh, and that is, you know, th th that's um, often, I think, in, in repressive um, um, governments, what, what you see is that women are more willing to stand up uh, for... Uh, for their rights, and especially when it comes to husbands and um, um, and children who are who are in jail, I I wanted to mention one one particular uh, woman um, that um, that has impressed me a lot. And two years ago, I profiled her in um, in the same December issue of Women of I think it was Women of 2018, uh, Lujain El Hathoul. She is a um, Saudi activist, very young um, and um, very passionate. Uh, she, she was part of the campaign um, to allow women to drive in, in Saudi Arabia. And um, Lujain has since 
uh, been jailed and there are reports that she's been tortured um, and she remains in, uh, in jail, even though the campaign that she fought for has actually been achieved because women now can drive in, in exactly. Saudi Arabia. Um, so I profile I, I met her um, and I profiled her for for this issue, and I find it very depressing that you know I'm I'm writing again for the same uh, issue of the magazine and she's in jail. But you're you're giving a voice to these women, and that in itself, I feel, is is a big you know contribution in advancing uh, this agenda that we were speaking about. And you mentioned Algerian women. I want to also give a big shout out to the Yemeni women that are actually uh, working super hard on you know prisoner exchange, and actually they're the ones who are achieving these things. And you know things have been frozen for many years, and they were able to you know, push this uh, forward, the prisoner exchange uh, issue forward. And I think in Syria, in Syria as well, if you look at the past, um, the past few years, I think women have played a very important role in, in trying to bring um, peace to, to Syria, have not, have not been uh, successful uh, on, on the whole, but I think they have been successful on, on the margins. Indeed, indeed. I want to take us back a little bit, back to the newsroom. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about who is Janet Bot, and who is the, uh, right. <laughs> the she said, he said bot. Yeah. I'm curious. So um, a few years um, ago, about three or four years ago, um, we noticed at the FT that we had um, very we did some research and and this is really all credit to uh to colleagues who've cared about this issue uh for a very long time so we had we we um we conducted some research to see how many women were readers of the ft and we found that there were very very few hmm. and that women see the ft as too intimidating uh, that it's a very male-oriented uh, publication, almost written for, for men, which obviously in my experience and the experience of a lot of women at the FT uh, did not resonate. Absolutely. Um, and so we, you know, we, we set up a, a group um, and we set out to um, try to change perceptions of, of the FT. And one way of doing that was to be a lot more conscious of what what how we present ourselves so how we present us, ourselves on online uh, in particular uh, what pictures do we use what headlines uh, do we use what stories are we are we promoting and so we we did various experiments one one of them was uh, what we called a project xx and that is that every day one of the editor picks a uh, story that we think is going to do better with women uh, readers and we test it so we promote it on the on our home page uh, and we track because we now you know the new we can actually track who's reading what uh, when they're reading where they're reading and so we've we, we've done this now for several years and we have a pretty good idea of the type of stories that that women like and very interestingly it's not that they are sort of soft stories. Um, one of one of the, the the sort of areas that women readers are most interested in is professional services and auditing in in okay. particular. Uh, accounting stories do really really brilliantly with women with women readers. Compliance stories as well. So when GDPR came, um, uh, this was you know I mean I was I was shocked at the number of women who were reading about GDPR. But that's also because there are a lot of women's women who work in compliance departments mm -hmm. stories about lawyers um, and, lo and law firms um, so so that was one project another project was uh, Janet bot and what is so we, we, we created this bot um, that would signal to us it would send us a, it was it send news editors a signal uh, when the number of pictures of women um, or women-friendly pictures on the homepage um, dropped below a certain uh, level. 
Um, and that is just sort of a reminder for news editors, you know, take, take another look. Um, one of the more recent initiatives um, has been uh, what we call the 5050 project. This is a project that was started by the BBC and sort of spread to a lot of uh, organizations and we joined it. It's a totally voluntary project. So various desks um, join if they want. Um, and um, this is an attempt to actually take a, take a much closer look at who we quote, how many, you know, how many people, uh, how many women do we quote as part of our, our, our reporting. Um, and it's very interesting because by making it voluntary, what's happened is um, more and more, uh, more and more desks have joined and have wanted to be to be part of it because to me you know 50 percent of the battle is really awareness i think the more aware uh news desks news editors and news organizations are uh about what they're not doing mm -hmm. uh the more progress you make because eventually it just becomes second nature to say you know this is a story that hasn't quoted a single woman or, is, you know, there is no, ra you know, racial diversity or ethnic di diversity. These are things that, you know, become part of what you do. But in the beginning, you need to sort of introduce them, um, have newsroom champions, um, bring in specific initiatives. And little by little, um, I think you see progress. And in fact, I mean, I'm, you know, it's di very difficult to move the needle. But we have been, uh, our, you know, our data shows that there are more women now reading the FT. Um, one of the other things we had noticed in our original re re uh, research is that even women who were subscribers to the FT were not actually engaging with it. Yeah. Uh, so they may get it for free from their, from their companies, but they weren't really reading it because they didn't think it was for them. So mm -hmm. we've put the focus a lot on how to engage um, more women. And I think we're, you know, we're doing better, but it is a long, long uh, struggle. Definitely. It's a daily struggle. And hearing you speak, I, you know, I feel how you're, you're a champion for inclusive journalism, right? The idea of inclusivity and how we can, you know, have uh, diverse groups, marginalized groups, voices more and more heard in media and in journalism. Um, I was well, we just have to, you know, we need to reflect the societies that we write about. Yes. Um, you know, we can't, we can't be, um, uh, we have to evolve just like societies have evolved, just like concerns have evolved. And we have to also keep in mind that younger generation of both journalists and of readers think differently from older generations. And for Absolutely. them, inclusion is a priority it is it is part of their lives in i think in a way that it wasn't you know for my generation for example yes indeed it was a non-issue uh, a few decades ago and now you know this inclusivity is trending and i think that uh, a lot of diplomas around the world are trying to champion that and here i wanted to ask you a, a question i was having this conversation the other day uh, with a colleague of mine who was telling me that you know how can we get uh, the media, uh, more newspapers and more media outlets to cover women, peace and security issues. She was telling me, it's just, we're just not sexy enough. You know, we don't make the news cycle. People don't want to read this. Um, maybe people don't want to read this, but could you give us a few tips on how we can make these stories uh, more palatable, more mainstream, more interesting to attract readers? I mean, I think that if, if, if you have a compelling story, whether it's about men or about women, and that is, you know, that is that is the basis of um, uh, of it. So I think that you know, if if you have personalities that you that you think are are doing um, um, are achieving and doing things that maybe the, the world doesn't know about, then I think you start with the personalities themselves and um and i think you you have to you have to promote um the issues possibly around the people 
rather than the people around the issues, uh, because that is always of greater interest to, um, I think, the media in general. Is is if, if you can if you can tell a story through a person, um, then you are um, you are more likely to get it uh, to be read by um, by people. So you know, look for compelling stories. Um, and and pitch these compelling stories, elev you know, elevate them in 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 the general consciousness, um, and and th I think that is how um, you you would get more attention. Yeah, I think it's a uh, it's an uphill road for us because you know we come uh, from uh, we're learning slowly that we can't have this conversation in echo chambers anymore. You know, we go to these conferences on on women, peace, and security, uh, on on gender equality, and we're clapping for each other. You know, one person gives a speech, the other one claps for the person, uh, but then we leave that space and we go back to our daily lives and once every year on in october when we're celebrating the the you know the anniversary of women peace and security we get a few op-eds in some newspapers uh, I, I'm really interested to continue this conversation with you and other uh, like-minded journalists who are rooting for inclusive uh, journalism on how we can, you know, sort of work together to advance uh, these kinds of news feeds uh, and, and uh, you know, introduce this to the, mo the mainstream population, you know, moved so so, I mean, one thing that I did, I noticed is um, uh, I also was going a lot to, to conferences about women. And, um, and I remember at one conference in Berlin, I did sort of start asking myself is, okay, I understand that um, it, it's been difficult to, to pierce uh, the sort of more mainstream conference circle for, for a lot of women and women feel more comfortable talking amongst each other um, and they do have an awful lot to say but I do think that there comes a there comes a stage when um, you if, you if you keep talking amongst yourselves then you, you're not getting heard by the other side I mean ideally you want all the gatherings of women uh, to, to be attended by men Absolutely. And, not, and not by women. And so Absolutely. I think that that trying to break into the general audience is is very important uh, because, you know, we are at risk of, of sort of talking amongst uh, each other for a long time, even if that's more comfortable for us. But I think this is a question of phases and stages. And in the in the next stage, I think that you need to mainstream this again, now that you're comfortable, uh, sp you know, speaking and being on panels and, and moderating panels, you want to bring that back into the main sort of peace and security space rather than making it only women in peace and security. Yes, I think that, that's sound advice. And uh, I think a lot of our listeners will relate to that. Um, you covered the Arab Spring. And, you know, here we are almost a decade later, um, looking at the region, quite fragmented, quite volatile. Um, what are your, you know, if you can give us your few two cents on what happened to the Arab Spring? Um, what happened to the Arab Spring is that the, the forces that um, wanted it to succeed were weaker than the forces that wanted it to fail. Um, I compare the Arab Spring um, to um, uh, the revolutions in, in Eastern Europe um, and the fall of the, of, uh, the Berlin Wall of the Soviet um, Union. Uh, what Eastern Europe had was an anchor. They had the, the Western European countries, the leading European countries, cheering for their success. Um, and bringing them along and integrating them into, into the EU. Um, what, what I think the Arab Spring lacked is an anchor, is, is countries that would have uh, pledged and implemented support, political support, financial support, in order to make these revolutions a, a success. Because you have to remember that these were all countries where 
there was very little um, practice of, of democracy. And, you know, for many of them, democracy meant, you know, get, let's get rid of a dictator and have elections. And elections are not necessarily the, the answer at the very beginning, you know, you need to establish political parties, you need to establish uh, competition between political parties and enough um, choice for, uh, for a population, for voters, uh, before you have uh, elections. And so, you know, it's, I tend to see the Arab Spring um, as a moment in in history that I don't think you need to, you, you should evaluate on its own. I think it's you know it's a process uh, in history. You've got you know setback. You, you've got a, uh, progress setbacks, and you'll get you'll get progress again. Uh, so it was a, a moment of awakening. It um, and then there was a backlash to that awakening. And at some point, there'll be another moment of awakening. And maybe the lessons from the Arab Spring would have been learned next time. I think many in the region are waiting for that uh, particular moment in time, especially the youth. Uh, you know, the, I know I'm sitting right here in Lebanon. I'm sitting in Beirut. Uh, and I look around and I see the new generation. Uh, you see university elections being won for the first time in majority, uh, majority uh, uh, the secular club. Uh, clubs and different universities uh, taking the highest number of seats. Uh, there is definitely a, a wave of, of change uh, coming. Uh, what do you tell these young men and women? Um, how much I patience? Them, how much patience should they, should I they have? Never to, I tell them never to give up hope. Uh, they can't, you know, they can't give up hope. I know that there there are a lot of reasons to give up hope. Uh, but they can't give up hope uh, because I think they're on the right side of history. I think uh, that's a really nice message for us to wrap up our podcast for today. Um, on behalf of the Aysan Faris Institute at AUB, at the American University of Beirut, and on behalf of UN Women, I would like to thank you for uh, being our first guest on this Diploma and Podcast Series. Rula Khalaf, editor of the Financial Times, thank you. Thanks for having me.